At the boarding school I attend on scholarship, I live in a dorm with the progeny of the founders and inventors of Firestone Tire, Jello, the hydrogen bomb, and the man named in the 1960s by the Guinness Book of World Records as the richest in the world. I can't afford to join my friends on their fast food runs. Kids make fun of my poorly fitting clothes from Goodwill that I wear to weekday coat and tie dinners. And after I tell my friends about my summer trip going car camping, they tell me about their trips to European resorts and an African safari. Fortunately, being the second best player on our varsity basketball team helps me fit in. We win our league championship for the first time in 25 years. During summer break, I visit the home of my roommate, Eric. We hook up with some friends from our dorm. I try to honor my father, a devoutly religious missionary from Japan, by resisting their peer pressure to drink. After finally giving in, my friends tell me that I don't remember it. They say, I stand up on the seat part of a chair so I'm high up, slam a magazine down on the table. Everyone goes insane cheering when I yell out, Beer must be evil. I feel good. A couple nights later, it's 1 a.m. I can't sleep. My mind is fixated on this German chocolate cake that I spied during Eric's tour of his home. He said while nodding toward this lady to his left, Miss Nguyen makes all our desserts homemade. Help yourself to anything anytime. Honey bring hunger brings me to the kitchen. Paranoia makes me steal my way there in the dark because I don't want to be busted by Eric's parents. Light from the refrigerator pierces the darkness as I open its doors. Suddenly from the kitchen doorway, are you hungry, Rob? Click. The lights turn on. I freeze. Out of the corner of my eye, I see her. I start laughing. Thank goodness it's Eric's stepsister, not his parents. <laughs> I thought it was your parents. Did Eric tell you the secret? <laughs> no. The dessert Miss Nguyen made today are in the back. She does that so we eat the old ones first. She reaches way back into the three-section industrial refrigerator freezer and pulls out a tray. I exclaim, Napoleons? My favorite. They are so fancy. The custard is to die for. Miss Nguyen says the key is to add a dash of whipping cream. She puts one Napoleon each on two plates. I fill two glasses with milk. We go to her room with our bounty. Kate is a fire that consumes the oxygen in the room, leaving me breathless and hot. She's a bomb that fries my mental circuitry. She's a temptation that lures my Mr. Hyde out of my Dr. Jekyll. As she tells me about herself, her stories begin to answer this question I'd been wondering. From the first time she comes to campus with Eric's parents, why does it feel like she goes out of her way to be nice to me? Her background tells me the answer. She lived humbly until her mom met Eric's dad and they marry. She knows what it's like to be the poor person in a room. The nicest thing she does is draw me into group conversations, like a couple days later when Eric drives us to a Grateful Dead concert. We stop on the way to pick up Kate and her boyfriend, Tom. They've been arguing, which they continue in the van. I'm not controlling you, Tom. I drink with you. Everything's cool. I drink with my friends. Not cool. You won't see me afterwards. I'm controlling me, not you. Yeah, right. Kate asks me. Rob, what do you think of drinking? Eric speaks up from the driver's seat. Oh, Rob doesn't drink. Or smoke or take medicine. That's right, Eric told me about that. You don't even take Tums? I'm embarrassed by my differences, so I mumble. I guess so. I don't like medicine either. Oh, really? My mom says that medicine is bad when people use it as a first resort instead of last. My parents say the same thing, and they say that medicine suppresses the elimination of my body's toxins. Toxins? Yeah, like runny nose, coughing, pus, phlegm, vomit, and diarrhea. When I projectile vomit, they tell me, well, your body purifying, you so lucky, congratulations. They say congratulations? Yeah. It's like, they like, I jump in, orifice ejections. 
We crack up until Kate's boyfriend interrupts. Rob, so you're a virgin, pharmaceutically speaking. Yeah, pharmaceutically speaking. My life is like the game whack-a-mole. Every time I stick my head up, some dude with a hammer whacks it down like Kate's boyfriend Tom. And after college, like my co-worker Chuck. Due to my frequent cardigans, Chuck calls me Mr. Rogers. When my face turns red from drinking, he calls me Stoplight. One time he hosts a champagne party, everyone buys their champagne from a specialty liquor store, which I didn't know I was supposed to do. Chuck sees a lost bottle of champagne in the fridge. Mr. Rogers, you're the one that brought that champagne from Walmart? He's why I don't like going clubbing. He's always on the prowl at all the clubs, ready to make fun of me when he sees me. That plus, bouncers decide who gets in and who doesn't. And no woman goes clubbing thinking, I think tonight I'm going to hook up with a Japanese dude. Okay, Cupid's dating research confirms women find Asian men the least desirable. So when my friends tell me they're going to Manhattan's hottest nightclub, the Palladium, I say no thanks. But like my boarding school friends, my New York friends also like to bring me drinking. I love how they turn drinking into games, especially mano a mano, one man left standing, head games. They play to drink each other into submission. My friends stop by my apartment on their way to the Palladium. I'm a sucker for peer pressure and I'm touched they came to get me. We take a taxi. We wait 40 minutes in line. Sure enough, the bouncer refuses to let me in. It's because I'm Asian, I know it. He says he can't let in more guys than gals. Humiliated, I start walking away to flag a taxi. My friend Glenn yells out to me, found some women in line and ask if you can come in with them. I shake my head and wait and reply under my breath, no thanks. Why do I feel bad? I never wanted to go clubbing anyway. After a few taxis pass me, finally one slows down for me. I'm walking toward it when its back window slides open to reveal a head turner. Our driver says he's new to New York. Do you know where the Palladium is? I'm heading there now. I'll walk you over. It's just a few blocks away. Thank you. She's introducing herself to me when a second passenger steps out and screams, Rob, is that you? Kate, that is crazy. I thought it might be you when I saw your cardigan. We catch up while walking toward the Palladium. Kate clutches my right hand, her friend clutches my left hand. I'm sandwiched between two goddesses. Endorphins flood my bloodstream. Some switch in my head gets flipped. I start swaggering like the baddest ass Japanese pimp ever. We do approach the bouncer who rejected me just moments earlier. Before I can even speak, he lifts the rope and waves us in in front of all those other jokers waiting in line. Once inside, we get some drinks. They tell me about how they've just returned from a business trip to Tokyo. I ask them what they thought about the food. They love Japanese food. Their favorite during their last trip is at this high-end food court with only specialty restaurants. They talk over each other, listing them off. Tonkatsu restaurant, tempura restaurant, shabu shabu, ramen, soba, and of course, sushi restaurant. They choose the tempura restaurant where they say the chef serves them from the frying pan direct onto their plates. Tempura, so sublime. I'm like getting hungry just listening to them. Then out of the blue, someone yells at me, Mr. Einstein. It's Glenn. He calls him Mr. Einstein, the other famous cardigan wearer. I turn toward his voice. I see him leading our friends walking toward us. Ugh, Chuck's here. I knew it. My mood rebounds when Glenn yells out, I knew you'd get in here. I start high-fiving everyone whose heads face me but whose eyes lock in on Kate and her friend. I introduce everyone to each other. Soon enough, everyone's drinking shots. Chuck eggs me on. Come on, Mr. Rogers, join us for some shots. No thanks, Chuck. Come on, every round you drink, I'll pay for everyone. Everyone? Every round? 
Every round, every round. I'll drink with you shot for shot tonight, Chuck. Hey, gang, I'm paying for all you jokers every round Mr. Rogers drinks, so let's light his face up. After a few rounds, Chuck looks at my face and says, We're stoplight tonight. I grab my shot glass. I slam it back. That is tasty, Chuck. I must be thirsty tonight. Where's the next round at? From now on, you and me. Double shots. I wave my empty shot glass at him. I'm waiting, man. We couple more rounds. Double shots. I ask Chuck, hey, you're not slowing down, are you? I grab his shot glass. I slam that back. Oh, no, we ran out again. You're not running out of money, are you? After a couple more rounds, Chuck is swimming in drunken swagger. He approaches Kate and brags about how we're investment bankers working for Morgan Stanley. Then he asks her about Japan. Is it true in crowded trains the men rub themselves up against women's bodies? And they sell women's used underwear in vending machines? They're such perverts. You know why? Work, 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 work. That's all they do. They become sick Asian robots. That's why I can't get into a top business school, because they're filled up with sick Asian robots. Kate says, you're the one that's sick. Hey, Chuck, I'm Mr. Einstein to you from now. And uh, hey, I hope it's all right. I gave the server a couple Franklins to pour me water instead of liquor. <laughs>